Hi, Caleb with Brownhouse here. In today's video, we're going to be covering the process of actually getting an SBR, or short barreled rifle. Uh, this is a part two video, so if I'm saying any terminology or anything you're not getting, uh, you probably need to go watch that part one. But let's jump right into it. So, as far as actually getting an SBR, uh, the forms you have to submit to the ATF. So, there's two ways to go about it. It's either going to be a form one or a form four. And to determine which one you're going to need all depends on what you're actually doing. So if you're buying a gun that was already manufactured as an SBR uh, from the factory, like a Daniel Defense uh, Mark 18 factory gun or something like that, um, what you're going to need there is a Form 4. So Form 4, just remember it this way, the Form 4 is for firearms that were already manufactured as SBRs. If not, if you have an AR rifle or an AR pistol um, that you're converting to an SBR, so either you know a full 16 inch gun or a gun that came from the factory with a pistol brace, for those you're gonna need to do what's called a Form 1, which technically kind of puts you as the manufacturer of that SBR because you're converting it from a gun that wasn't. Um, so all you need to remember is if you're making it yourself, Form 1, uh, if you're buying it already, Form 4. It's just that easy. Uh, there's may, way more complicated stuff out there uh, you can get into, but that's all you need to know there. So now we need to get into you know how you're actually going to register it. There's a few different ways to do that as well. And uh, they each have their pros and cons. So you can either do it as an individual, all right? So whenever you actually doing the form, filling out the paperwork here, you can do it as an individual or you can do it as a trust. So if you're doing it as an individual, once you get that tax stamp, you're the only one that can basically be in possession of the gun. You have to go with it everywhere. So, you know, if your you know, buddy, family member, whatever, wants to take it to the range uh, or wants to, you know, do whatever with it, you got to go with them. Now, if you do a trust, you can put, you know, trustees on that Basically, basically that, that whole you know, trust itself. And whenever you do that, any trustee can take the gun without you know, the main person, which is you. Uh, they can take it and be in possession of it legally, uh, which is you know, pretty cool if you, you, know, you got a group of friends or a bunch of family members or whatever uh, that like to shoot as well, uh, and you wanna, want them to be able to take it, then that's the way to go. Uh, it's a little bit easier as far as you know, actually getting the guns on there and uh, position and stuff like that goes. So if I had to recommend one way to do it, individual versus trust, I would say just set up a trust. Um, they are a little bit more expensive because you actually have to pay for the trust itself. And people, you know, pay gun trust lawyers to set it up and, and that kind of stuff. So they can be a little bit more expensive than just your $200 tax stamp. But uh, they're definitely the way to go if if you're concerned about you know what I just talked about. Now, the pros to doing it as an individual is that you just pay the $200 tax stamp, that's it. You don't have to pay any additional fees other than like your passport photo and fingerprints, but those are nothing. Um, and there's less paperwork involved as an individual as well. But you know, like I said, gun trust has its own benefits. Now, whenever you're doing the forms, you can do it the old fashioned paper form way, which I do not recommend at all, or you can do what's called e-forms. So ATF set up this nifty web service called the e-forms, and they do that for both the form one and form four, so super easy there. They are way easier to fill out, they take less time to do, and, and the turnaround time is a lot shorter. So whenever you're doing NFA item stuff, uh, one of the nightmares you always hear is like, man, it's ATF has had my paperwork and for you know six, seven, eight months, a year, or whatever. Uh, e forms are significantly shorter, so uh, I would not recommend even taking the paper route at all. Just do the e forms. Another really cool benefit about the e forms, uh, and I mentioned you do have to get a passport photo, and you have to get your fingerprints done whenever you submit all this information to the ATF. Now. If you're using the e-forms, you can actually save your fingerprint cards on there. Um, I forget the technical term they use for it, but basically, so your your fingerprints are saved there, 
So if you want to buy more NFA items, uh, yes, you have to do the whole process for each NFA item. Uh, if you want to do more NFA items, you don't have to go get fingerprinted again. They're already there, saved. So uh, e-forms are just, they're just the way to go, guys. Just, just trust me on that. So uh, that, like I said, the ATF set up this nifty little web service and they kind of, it's pretty, you know, pretty easy to understand. Uh, you jump on the website, you can, I mean, you can look at it without actually submitting it. So just jump on their website, check it out and uh, go from there. So another thing to note is that, you know, form one versus form four, I'll jump back to that real quick here. If you're doing a form four, and like I said, form four is whenever you're buying the gun already manufactured as an SBR, you don't have to get anything engraved on your lower receiver. Now, if you do a form one, you have to get engraved and the ATF has requirements for size and you know stuff like that. But on your lower receiver, you have to have engraved your name or the name of your trust, uh, your city and state. Those things have to be on your lower receiver for a form one. All right, so let's talk about some other stuff here now. Whenever you're actually doing the paperwork, there's gonna be a section there uh, for caliber and you can submit multiple calibers, which I recommend doing, uh, because if you just register it as, you know, 556 and you now run a 300 blackout upper, uh, then that's technically not legal. So put all the calibers you think you're gonna be using on that form and go from there. Now, what happens if you're an individual or you have a trust or whatever and you die? What happens to your gun? So this is actually one of the scenarios where um, the transferee of that gun from you to, you know, your, your beneficiary, your, your heir, whatever, uh, they can be transferred this firearm. They still have to do all the paperwork, um, but they don't have to pay the tax stamp in that scenario uh, as of the time of this video. Anyways, you know, who knows what's going to be changing. I should say everything is at the time of this video because all this stuff is subject to change, as you guys will know. Uh, so yeah, so it, and also, if you have a trust set up and you want to transfer it to someone, um, let's say you're the person that's getting your estate isn't on the trust, uh, so then you would still do a Form 5. Form 5 is, you know, whenever this gun has to be transferred for some reason like that, uh, you know, either your death, uh, you're in really poor health, um, or the firearm becomes inoperable and you want to transfer it to a dealer to basically just get rid of it or something like that. So those are those are your form five scenarios. Uh, it's basically just now you got to get rid of the gun for whatever reason. So it is possible to transfer it if you die. It doesn't just go away because you died. Now the gun, no one can have it. Uh, that's not how it works. Form five got you taken care of on that. So if you have any questions or comments, I know I was kind of given a high level kind of brief overview on this. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to post them down below. And if you haven't already, go ahead and hit that like and subscribe button. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time.